Nothing like it is in the mornings. <laughs> uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at that tonight. And uh, we've, uh, we've been following Paul through here, uh, and he's been describing, we've, we've talked about it with, with some detail, uh, that he, the overarching theme is he's describing the difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. And he's described some of that. But how many of you know that there is a lens that we can look through uh, when we uh, read our Bibles, especially in the Old Testament? But it applies here, too. Brian made mention of it this morning that uh, if you're not careful, you'll start looking at the New Testament like it's the new law like it's a new set of rules, uh, and, and that, that's, that might hold you, but that's not really what, what, what this is about. This is about uh, learning God's ways and walking in His ways, and there's a lens that we can look through that only comes by way of the indwelling Holy Spirit that helps us to see what's actually being said here, and I'm hoping that we can identify that tonight. I'm hoping that we can look at this a little differently because it looks like, as we're going through here, uh, that, that he is uh, identifying these sins and, and pointing out bad people and, 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 and really coming down hard on this church for these sinful acts, you see. But that's really not what this book is about. This is a letter. It wasn't the first letter that he wrote. But it is a letter that he wrote to the church leadership. Right? And the Corinthian church, and um, i got to be careful with my words here. But the uh, Corinthian church was, uh, uh, they, were, they were heavy in exercising a lot of spiritual gifts. There was a lot of prophecy going on. There was a lot of speaking in tongues going on. There was a lot of praying in tongues going on. And I think that they, much like the principle I'm talking about, uh, the Jewish people, they thought that they were righteous by their keeping of the law or their, you know, pretending to keep the law or whatever. They thought they were righteous by the things they were doing. The Corinthian church here wasn't that far from that principle because they thought they were righteous. They thought they were spiritual by the exercising of their spiritual gifts. But Paul is telling them, look, you're walking, you're not walking in the spirit, you're walking in the flesh. And the identifying of these different sinful things that's going on in the church, he's saying, if you don't believe me, here's the evidence. Here's the evidence. He's not saying, you, 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 you're going to hell or or you're in trouble, or you're condemned. He's not saying any of that. He's trying to reach a pit because we're talking about pride here. He's attacking the pride that's going on in the church. And this is something that every one of us needs to be aware of in our own hearts because we have prideful hearts. All the ways of a man are right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit or the motives or the intentions of our hearts. You, 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 everybody okay with that? All right, so let's just jump in to chapter 5 here. And now, now I want to just to solidify this point of Paul attacking the pride uh, here. Uh, I'm going to start in, in chapter 4 and verse 18. And he says, now some are puffed up. Uh, he was talking about in that chapter uh, 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 the, the, the difference that they're making. He said, some say I'm a follower of Apollos, and some say I follow Peter, and some say I follow Paul. And he said, is Christ divided? We're not divided. This isn't what this sectarianism, this divvying up, that's of the flesh, right? That's coming from a prideful position, okay? And so, and so it's not for condemnation. He even said it at the, in verse 14. He said, I don't write these things to shame you, but to warn you. Right? You're walking in the flesh. Okay, so jump down to verse 18 in chapter 4, and he says, Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are 
puffed up or prideful, but the power, and the NLT helps with that. It says, do, uh, I'll know if the power of God is in you or if this is just a bunch of words and pretense, right? Okay, so I'll know. Okay, so that's what he's talking about is, is pride here, and he's talking about the walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. You've got some good spiritual activity going on here, church leadership, he's talking to them. But we need some practical application of the Word of God, right? So that's where we're going toward. We're still kind of trying to identify some of these things. So chapter 5, verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported <laughs> that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Okay, if you're NASB, I don't think it says that. I think it says as such it doesn't even exist among the Gentiles. Is that what it says, Charlie? Does it? Okay, so what, 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 does, what does that mean? It's not even named among the Gentiles, right? Yeah, he said they wouldn't claim this. You're puffed up about it. You're proud about it. You're saying, hey, we're, we're okay here because we're speaking in tongues and we're prophesying and we're doing all this stuff, right? They're proud, about, so they're not even paying attention to the, the corruption that's beginning in the church. This will defile the church, right? Matter of fact, my, my heading, my subheading in my Bible says immorality defiles the church. It, it'll corrupt it. Because, and it, well, let me, let me just keep going. Okay, so it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named or claimed among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And, and you're puffed up, you're proud, and rather have not mourned, you're not grieving over this, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you? Uh, for, uh, for I indeed as absent, for I indeed as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present. Him who has done this, so done this deed. Now, we just looked in the chapter before where Paul said, uh, he said, I, I, don't, I don't judge anything, right? I don't even judge myself. You remember that from last Sunday night? But, but, but remember what we decided what he was actually saying? That was about a prideful position of putting ourselves in a position of authority so that we could say, you're going to hell, or you're not walking in the Spirit, or you're, you know, don't put the robe on and seat, seat yourself on a judge's bench where you can pass judgment, not even on yourself. The Lord is the judge. We're to be humble before the Lord. Don't be, right? Okay, so that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about you've got sense enough that you can discern what's right and what's wrong here. And you think that some of the things that you're doing will cover this. Now, he's not saying kick him out and send him to hell. He's saying the way to repentance is to let the flesh, let him have what he wants here. What he wants here, the, turn him over to the Lord, right? Turn him over to the Lord. Let him find his place of repentance, right? That's what he's saying. And so, so, so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan. Okay, are we sending him to hell? No, this is who he's following, <laughs> right? There's only two principalities and two powers. We don't like hearing that, but if I'm not serving God, I'm serving the devil, <laughs> And that's ugly, and that's hard to hear, but that's the way it is. There's only two principalities, Christ, Antichrist, God, Satan, good, evil, right? And we, we need to keep that squared away in our minds. Um, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved. Remember? All the ways of a man are right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the motives, the spirit. God's jealous for his spirit that's in us. And so the hope is to let this man have what he's after 
and deal with those consequences for the purpose of repentance. That's what God did to me. I'm sure you have your own story that's rolling in your head now. But somebody had to hand me over. Some people, my family, had to hand me over. If this is what you want, go get it. The Lord took his hand of protection off of me at some point and said, okay, if this is what you want, go ahead, because that was the way to pay the consequences for that so that I would repent and be standing here tonight. Now, we want to believe the prosperity gospels, you know, right? To where we're never going to see another poor day. When I say, Jesus saved me, then boxes of money are going to fall from the sky, and I'm never going to have another hard time, and I'm never going to grieve again, and I'm never going to have a broken heart, and it's not going to be hard. I'm never going to see another poor day, and it's all going to be rainbows and unicorn farts moving forward, and everything's going to be great. We want to believe that. But we have a carnal nature that is predisposed we have a or hardwired with a propensity to sin. Now, we're not under the bondage of sin if we are sincerely in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But we always want to go back and look through the lens of religion if we're not careful. You see, and so that makes the difference in do we see that this is ministry that's happening here by kicking this guy out of the fellowship until he pays the consequences for what he's doing to keep from defiling the church and God's name with this kind of immorality, right? Not celebrating this stuff. We're not saying you're going to hell. We're saying that we don't do things like that. That's not the Lord that I serve. That's not the God that I serve. He has called us out of immorality. Now you've got this prideful position that you're super spiritual because of these things that you're doing, but I'm showing you, I'm speaking as if I were Paul, I'm showing you the evidence that you're not walking according to the Spirit, working in tandem with the Word. You're walking according to the flesh. Right? Remember? Flesh According to Galatians, according to Romans, according to Corinthians here, religion, external religion, without a relationship, a complete submitting and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, and a, and a, and a, and a dedication, a devotion uh, to, 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 to learning His ways and to worshiping Him no matter how I feel, etc., etc., etc. That doesn't mean I'm never going to sin. Doesn't mean I'm not going to lose my cool. Doesn't mean I'm not going to romp, spout off my mouth. It doesn't mean, but I'm in this relation. He's renewing me in the spirit of my mind because I'm in this relationship with Him. You see, and that's what He's saying. He said, you're not really engaging in the relationship and the evidence is this, 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 this this and this back to you that's what Paul's saying here we're off the path here folks and just like he said at the end of chapter 4 I'm not saying this to shame you I'm not saying this because I'm mad at you I'm not saying this because I think I'm better than you I'm saying this because I love you Saying it's because the Word of God says we're supposed to be transformed in our minds. And you're not cooperating with that process. He tells me that a lot. You're not cooperating with me here. And there's going to be some consequences for this that I just assume you not pay, son. We've done enough of that. Let's get back on the path. Now, immorality. He's not really hammering on the immorality as much as he's hammering on the attitude that they have about it. They're just ignoring that. Like, that's nothing. Because, remember, you remember what, where was it when Jesus said it? He said, on that last day, 
There's going to be many people coming saying, Master, but didn't we work miracles in your name? And didn't we prophesy in your name? And, and he said, I'm going to say, I never knew you. That's Paul's concern writing to this church. I don't want you to get to that day to where you think because of the things that you're doing or you think according to your own speculation, according to the wisdom of the world, or you think because of spiritual activity that you're okay when you're not walking in the Spirit. You're walking in the flesh. And here's the evidence. You're glorying. He says it right here. This is what he's concerned about is their prideful position about it. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven. That you may be a new lump. I'm talking about a lump of dough. You know what leaven is. It's yeast. Put a little bit of yeast and a big old lump of dough. And work it. And that little pinch works through the whole dough. You know what happens when the leaven works through it? What's the dough do? It puffs up. <laughs> right? So you got a little bit of leaven here by making an exception and we're not determining, we're not putting the judge's robe on, we're not sitting on God's throne and saying, you, you need to do this or you can't do that. or I'm not taking his spot on the bench and passing judgment on this. I'm saying that I care about you. And Paul was in a unique position to say, I have come from someplace that's similar to this. And it's easy to get the wrong idea along the way and think you're doing right because Paul was a very religious person. You remember when he was Saul of Tarsus, right? It's easy to get off track here. And I love you, and I want to get you to get back on track. That's what the purpose of this is. That you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. Now, leaven or yeast is a picture of sin, because a little tiny bit will infect the whole congregation, the whole lump, if you will. It'll infect it, and it'll cause a lot of problems. There's a lot of consequences that come from that. Since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Okay, so you've been washed and cleansed, and the sin or the leaven has been removed from you, right? You've been cleansed. Okay, so we can, we, he's going with a picture of this Passover feast. Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us, so the penalty has been paid. The debt's been satisfied. Propitiation has been made. There's no more work to be done, only allegiance and loyalty and love for God and love for your neighbor by walking in this relationship, you see. And so the Christ, the Passover lamb was sacrificed for us. All that's done. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, is he talking about going to a Jewish tradition? It's like circumcision. He said, well, Paul, uh, Brian made reference to it from Romans. Paul said the circumcision, external circumcision in the flesh, it, it's nothing. It was a sign, you see. It was a sign, but what, what Jesus has come, what he said, he said, I want the circumcision of the heart. I want this internal change in you. I want this separate. You know what happens when you circumcise somebody? You separate that piece of flesh from the body. That's what Paul's trying to do here. He's asking for circumcision in the heart that we separate from the flesh or the carnal nature the sinful nature we've had the sacrifice made for us Jesus the Passover lamb has been sacrificed on our behalf we've been washed and cleansed and made into a new creation now act like it do we believe that his sacrifice was enough and that our sin has been completely washed and cleansed and removed 
and cast into a sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the... But do we believe that? I know I still struggle with that at times. I want to strap on the judge's robe, that'd be God's judge robe, and judge myself. And I do it a lot. And there's only one reason for that. And it's because I'm really not truly and fully believing that what Jesus did for me was enough. That I am, because of Him, good enough. I don't know. I can't say where the heart's and the minds were of these Corinthians. But I'll bet you that thing that I just described that I struggle with, that thing that you just thought about that you struggle with pertaining to these things wasn't far from it. Right? I need to feel like that what I'm doing is right. But it's always not. I mean, it's not always, I guess I should say. I need the church. I need the word. I need the worship. I need a pastor in authority over me. I need the fellowship. I need friends who are walking this walk with me to say, you know what? We're not going to let you fall. That's what Paul's saying to the church leadership in this church. I'm not going to, you're not going to fall on my watch. You are not going down on my watch because I'm calling the Spirit of God and all of heaven's resources to put this stuff to bed. I'm going to point this out to you because I love you. Indeed, Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us. The debt's been paid. Therefore, let us Keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with religion, not with the following of the law or the trying to follow the law or even the thinking that we can be righteous by the keeping of the law, not by external religion. Let's don't keep the feast that way, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, which is what we're seeing here in the church, Corinthians. It's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing some wickedness. We're seeing some malice here. We're seeing some people who are doing some things that you know good and well you don't need to be doing. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, John said that the law came through Moses, right? But grace, that divine power that gives us everything we need for life and godliness, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so redemption, grace, forgiveness, washing, cleansing, the Passover lamb who was sacrificed for us and made us unleavened, clean, pure, righteous, holy, made us God's people, praise the Lord, came through Jesus Christ. It's with that unleavened bread, sincerity, truth, honesty, right? That we keep the feast in our hearts. Does that make sense to everybody? (laughs) Verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle. That's the first one or the one before this. I don't know what number this was. He wrote several letters to the Corinthians. I know this isn't the first one. I think there was one before it. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. Verse 11, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, 
who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Why? Huh? Well, if, if that's still a practice, then the evidence says that you're either still separated from God or God's not really Lord over your life or the Holy Spirit isn't taking effect on the inside of us if these are the practices that we see, which is what he's saying to the church. I'm seeing this sexual immorality, and I know for a fact that my God on the inside of me won't allow that. So if this is still our practice, then maybe you're still Lord of your own life. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, I, but, but you know, I'm not saying that you're going to hell for it, but I'm saying that you probably need to make some practical application, the pragmatic application of the Word, and get a little more sincerity and truth in this relationship, a little more openness of the heart before the Lord, a little more confession, a little more honesty. Maybe we need to do some confessing of the sins of getting honest before the Lord. Maybe we need to look into that perfect mirror. Maybe we need to realize our unrighteousness so that we will come to the cross with an open and sincere heart, with a truthful countenance and say, Lord, save me. I need your righteousness I can't find any of my own <clears throat> he said I'm not telling you to be concerned about the world yeah the world's immoral yeah the world's covetous and idolatrous. It's ridiculous. But it's their world. We're not trying to clean the world up. We're not trying to judge the world. We're not trying to be a prosecutor. We're not called to be a prosecuting attorney or a judge or anything or a policeman. We're not called to be the FBI launching investigations into the affairs of all the people of the world that we see. If we would, let me back out of that. We're called to be a witness. witness I'm not looking down my nose at you I'm not thinking I'm righteous matter of fact I know I'm unrighteous but the Passover lamb was sacrificed for me I accepted his sacrifice on my behalf I accepted his payment for my sin I accepted his not guilty verdict I accepted what God said would be mine in Christ Jesus And I'm just telling you that I used to be just like you, and I, it doesn't have to be this way. He saved me. He gave me a different life, a life that I never even realized was possible. I remember <coughs> one time, I, I'm trying to remember if it was in an AA meeting. I kind of think it was. But I was struggling pretty hard. And a guy told me one night, he said, Hey, you don't have to be alone and afraid anymore. I'm not alone and afraid. He said, Why are you so angry? Who are you fighting? He understood. He understood. But I was afraid. And I was expressing that fear with anger. They're expressing this fear and aloneness that they're experiencing being separated from God or not being one in communion with God, not walking with the Spirit, being absent of the Spirit of God. They're missing something. They need satisfaction. They need fulfillment just like I did, just like you did. You're missing something. And you can express that with immorality or idol worship or whatever you covetous or whatever you want. You can express it in many different ways. But this is just the evidence that you need just a closer walk with thee. 
<clears throat> doesn't have to be this way, brother. You don't have to be alone and afraid anymore. <laughs> you know, sexual purity doesn't make us righteous. <laughs> Abstaining from idols doesn't make us righteous. Cleaning up our language. My sobriety from alcohol and drugs that doesn't make me righteous. My church attendance, my tithe giving, my service to this church, my it doesn't make me righteous. None of the things that our carnal nature tries to convince us will make us righteous actually make us righteous. But these acts of service to the bride honor our Savior who gave Himself for us and gave us, clothed us, he wrapped that robe around us, man, and said, you belong to me now, and I'm going to clothe you in my righteousness. That's what the Passover lamb did for us. That's what Paul's trying to get through to them. Your thinking is flawed, and it's skewed. And you think because you got this, this, and this going on. <laughs> Do you hear me praying in tongues? Do you hear that? It's pretty awesome, wasn't it? Remember when they gave the altar call and we all ran up there? I mean, I know he did and she did and they did, but did you hear mine? <laughs> Woo! Right? You're puffed up. You're proud. The deeds of the flesh are evident. They're easy to see. They're obvious. That's what I'm telling you. These are the deeds of the flesh, Corinthians. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't relieve us of the consequences. Amen? For what have I to do, verse 12, what have I to do with judging those who are outside? <laughs> do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. See, I don't get to put on his robe and sit on his throne. I don't get to step in. I got this one. You just take a break, Lord. And I don't get to do that. That's his business. All I'm called to be is a witness. This is what Jesus has done for me. What have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. It's their world. But we're called to a higher standard. And if we're going to be named as a brother in Christ... then we don't get to dabble in the life that we were rescued from. Right? I saw a thing on, I think it was a meme on Facebook once that said, <coughs> you can't break free from the demons that you enjoy playing with. Now that doesn't mean that we get to clean up our act and we're really going I'm really going to show you Lord what a good boy I can be and everything. No. No, he has to change our wanter. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to submit ourselves to the redemption plan of God in Christ from before the foundation of the world that's still unfolding to this day and be faithful to that in sincerity and truth right father we thank you lord for your word 